Okay. Are we ready to start? Do I have a thumbs up from staff? Anyone? Looks like we're live. Okay. Well, thank you. Welcome to the first committee, uh, this interim of the Joint Committee on Ending Homelessness. Um, we have some new members that we will introduce in a minute. Just wanted to review for those of you that are here and those that are watching. This is a joint committee with the Senate and the House where we work during the interim. Um, we set an agenda. We try to listen um, to advocates. We pick topics to look at in this very difficult issue of housing. Before the pandemic, we were already dealing with an exceedingly high number and increasing number of homelessness in the state of Maryland, and the pandemic has obviously exasperated that. What we do try as a joint committee is to not overlap or dip too much into the work that we know the standing committees are doing um, with respect to these issues. We try to get updates, but then we try to take our time to prepare recommendations for the speaker that come from the things that we hear that aren't the center focus of the standing um, committees because there's no reason for us to, to redo the work um, that they're doing. Um, we listen to the advocates and Senator Washington and I do a lot of work behind the scenes. So I wanna encourage all of the members and the new members and those in the um, advocacy community and constituent community that are watching. Um, we have a limited number of hearings, but certainly send us emails, put in the topic line JCAH and um, your concerns from the hearings, any further questions that you felt like didn't get answered or any other ideas um, before we finalize our report. Um, good to say um, from our last report that we sent to the speaker um, from last session, we did end up uh, suggesting that the full legislature work on adaptive reuse. And uh, in the final days, the legislature did pass a work group on that. We are still waiting for the final appointments and Stuart Campbell from DHCD might be able to give us an update. Um, but just to give those of you an example that our, that our work does go um, you know, not just sit in a binder somewhere. We took that report and then were able to work on the recommendations um, that we gave to the speaker to come to fruition. And with that, um, I'll introduce the House members and then the Senator will take over. So right now we have uh, newly joining our committee, um, Delegate Bartlett. Do you wanna say hello and tell everyone where you're from? Hello, everyone. It's great to be an official member of this committee. <laughs> You've been following us. <laughs> I've been following, um, as this is a, a, a important um, topic to me. Um, I am from Anne Arundel, and I represent District 32. Thanks. Thank good to you. see you, both of you. So good to have you. Delegate Layman. Thank you so much, um, Delegate Valentino Smith. I am so happy to be here. Um, I represent District 21, about 78% um, of that is in Prince George's County, Northern Prince George's County, um, College Park, Beltsville, Laurel, and about 22% is in Anne Arundel, um, the Piney Orchard area and uh, part of Gambrel. So I'm very happy to be uh, on board, thanks. Delegate Krim, a longstanding member of the committee and the one that was leading um, unaccompanied youth. And we'll be taking an update on that at some point too. Delegate Krim. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I thought we were just doing the new people. Great, glad, glad to be called upon. Uh, glad to see that uh, Delegate Bartlett and Delegate Lehman are here. Delegate Bartlett, of course, helped us with the unaccompanied uh, minors legislation and uh, was uh, very helpful in getting that passed uh, through her committee, uh, Judiciary. So uh, very happy to be here, but also uh, want to uh, give notice to this committee, this standing committee. Uh, Senator Lamb is also on, uh, I think is a new member, and uh, he and I are co-chairs of the uh, Joint Committee on, um, Audit Committee. And we just had a very disturbing audit uh, regarding um, investigations of child abuse and child neglect and investigations that uh, are not occurring in a timely fashion. So um, the members of that committee are, some of those members are on this committee. Uh, we were very disturbed about that and we'll be doing follow-up uh, before the legislative session. 
uh, with the Social Services Administration. But uh, please, uh, ev everybody, all the legislators here who um, are, are obviously concerned about homelessness, I think you all would be equally concerned about these uh, child neglect issues that came up during the last audit. So um, I appreciate everybody's attention and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Cramen, for your work on that uh, committee. It is a lot of work. Delegate McKay, the good Delegate McKay. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> good uh, afternoon, everybody. I do represent uh, the far reaches of Western Maryland, of Garrett, I should say Allegheny and Washington County. Um, been a member for quite a while now. A lot of good work that we're doing. Unfortunately, we have a need for this community, uh, and that's the sad part. But um, look forward to learning some more, and uh, good to see everybody. Thank you. And, and Delegate McKay, we do crossover work with your house work group. Do you want to explain that just for a brief couple seconds? Yes. Uh, so I am co-chair with um, uh, the talented uh, Delegate Pam Queen with the um, Economic Stability Work Group, and um, we do crossover with this uh, uh, group as well as many other ones when it talks about making sure that the middle class uh, is strong and it doesn't fall back into the safety net. And um, so thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you, Delegate. We try to all work together in this area of homelessness and vulnerable so that we're not the work of everybody, but, but adding to each other's um, work. The other members of the committee that I don't see on, a new member, uh, Delegate Kittleman. I don't see Delegate Kittleman. She was just appointed the other day, so I understand her schedule might not have been accommodating. Um, we have the good delegate, uh, Edith Patterson, who told me she was not going to be able to be here today, and a very longstanding member that's worked with us on a lot of significant issues, Delegate Learman, who is not here yet, but may uh, join us later. And then before I turn it over to the Senate, we have our esteemed visitor, Delegate Wilkins. Delegate Wilkins leads the way on evictions and homelessness. We try to dovetail with her and then work uh, in the areas that they don't have as much time to do the intense focus on. Delegate Wilkins, welcome. You wanna say a couple things? Thank you so much. Yes, as uh, the good chair mentioned, I'm Delegate Janelle Wilkins. I represent District 20, which is the Silver Spring Tacoma Park White Oak area in Montgomery County. Very passionate and do a lot of work around renters' rights issues. And I appreciate the co-chairs um, for allowing me to be a visitor today. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're glad to have you and we'll be working strong with you as we do these recommendations going forward. Thank you, Delegate. I think I hit everybody, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you, Co-Chair. Um, the way we operate on this uh, committee is that we share the work. And as the delegate said, we are in constant contact during the interim, um, during session, but especially during the interim, uh, doing the good work around our goal of ending homelessness in the state of Maryland. Um, and this topic in particular, uh, focusing on uh, the housing relief programs and evictions programs are so key. key. I, I want to just kick us off with just a, a quote that came from the National Equity Atlas a study. The report said, allowing, this is the quote, allowing an eviction tsunami to take place would be a moral travesty and a policy failure that would deepen inequities at a moment when the federal government has prioritized addressing systemic racism and ensuring equitable recovery. Uh, and some that, from that same report, it's really clear that the vast majority of those facing eviction, uh, approximately 84% are low wage workers who have lost their jobs during the pandemic. So this intersection of the pandemic and the existing uh, inequities that we have in our housing system are something that are disproportionately impacting uh, Black, Latino, Asian, and other non-white groups. Um, the, the residents of our state are really suffering from a crisis, and we know there's a lot of factors there. Uh, this committee is really committed, this joint committee is to helping and, and making sure that they have some place to, uh, to turn. We know that it's a terrifying concept uh, to be without a home. Uh, and that there's a great deal of despair and hopelessness every day uh, dealing with this pandemic. Um, we know that there's so many factors 
that we consider, but we're committed to making and ensuring that there's affordable and safe housing. But we've also found throughout the work of this committee uh, over the, I believe, eight years of our existence that there's also mental health issues, there's substance addiction issues, there's unfair housing practices, domestic abuse, uh, just to name a few. Um, and so we're kicking off this season of our meetings, understanding that, yes, we are talking about housing, we're talking about buildings, but we're also talking about people uh, and families and individuals and that we have to have an integrated, compassionate uh, approach to that. Um, I'm honored again to, to uh, serve on this uh, committee with my fellow senators and give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. I don't, I know Jack, Senator Bailey is, I don't see him here. Am I missing him? Uh, Senator Benson, would you like to introduce yourself quickly and then we'll, we'll move on to the, the rest of the day. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> my name is Joanne C. Benson. I am the Senator in the 24th a Legislative District here in Prince George's County. And I am very, very uh, pleased to be a part of this very important committee because of uh, of all the years that I have been in Annapolis, this is probably one of the most difficult summers we've had to endure because of this very issue of homelessness. And we're getting ready to, uh, to face an onslaught of evictions, and you all know that. And so our job uh, and our, uh, as the committee is really, really cut out for us. And I certainly look forward to working as closely as I know how with this committee so that nobody, no child should be left behind and we should not have to deal with uh, evictions, domestic violence and these other uh, things that are wreaking havoc uh, in our communities. So I'm very concerned and I'm very glad to be a part of this very, 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 very important committee. Thank you, Senator Benson. Um, Senator Elthrith here, I can see. Yeah. Okay, uh, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. I'm Arthur Ellis. I represent District 28, Charles County in Southern Maryland, and I'm just pleased to be on this committee, um, which is uh, the work we do is more important now than ever, as mentioned by others. I just want to quickly say, I read a survey last week that was in the media that talked about young adults in Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia and in Virginia, over 40% of young adults have moved back home. And young adults is defined uh, 18, I believe, to 34, but 18 to mid 30 young adults. In Virginia, 40 plus percent of those in the category moved back home um, with their parents. Um, in Washington, D.C., and Maryland, it's in the high 20s, I believe it was like 27%. And so we have a great. Um, um, how should I say, uh, housing um, uh, crisis situation going on. Those fortunate enough to move back home, they can't. But so many of our constituents in Maryland, they don't have that backstop. And so we have to really um, be focused on our work because we are part of the solution. So with that, I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you to the delegates and the staff and my fellow senators. I look forward to this uh, particular here and today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lamb. Sure. Thank you, Senator Washington. Um, so Clarence Lamb, Senator in District 12, representing Howard and Baltimore counties. Um, I'll be very brief because I've got <laughs> I've got our newest member of our family here who's <laughs> very noisy. And so um, I'll just spare, you know, broader remarks. But wait, wait, let us see. Hold up again, please. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Congratulations! Oh, hey. too, so, um, so I'll probably be, hey, you grab my tie. <laughs> <laughs> it's great okay. to see you laugh that way, Senator Leo. That's wonderful. <laughs> I've never seen such a big smile on your face. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, these are obviously very important issues right now with the pandemic going on, and want to continue the conversation. Hope to hear from our witnesses soon. So. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And it, it's so good that we're here. We're, uh, the committee also uh, 
Uh, I believe we're just joined by an, another uh, a delegate, but uh, Senator Elfwitz is a member, uh, Senator Sollings is a member, and, and Bailey. And I'll just wrap up by saying we're here today. We're advocates, administrators, and legislators. Uh, we need, they, we all need the resources, information to help our most vulnerable Marylanders. And we're going to learn today from our presentations uh, to give us that knowledge that we need. Uh, and also, I want to say to the people, uh, who are out there that are listening, that are experiencing homelessness, you are not uh, your condition. Uh, Maryland is your home uh, and we're here and we're gonna make sure that we can help. So back to you, uh, Delegate. I think you're gonna introduce Delegate yes. Learman. We have the good Delegate Brooke Learman on. She is a fierce advocate for the vulnerable and in her own right has been a strong leader on this committee and many pieces of legislation. Um, working on this issue. So Delegate Learman, thank you for coming. You wanna say hello? Hi everybody, it's great to see you. Um, thanks so much to the leadership of our, for the leadership of our chairs and I'm happy to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Sorry, we're gonna start uh, just for those of you uh, in the audience or the advocates that, that need help or our good staff, if you're getting in touch with them or um, Hillary Klecker, Thomas Elder, who is a new dad and has sent pictures of his baby his first uh, hearing back. Thank you, Tom, Emily Haskell, and we have uh, Madeline Ross. So the Senator and I meet with staff ahead of time. We try and set out the interim agenda um, for you. So today, we're gonna um, hear from the Department of Legislative Services first, Emily Haskell, just to bring us up to date. Emily, you wanna start? Sure, and I think the slides are coming up. Uh, but thank you. My name is Emily Haskell. I'm a budget analyst at DLS, and the chair has requested that I provide a brief overview of housing funding in the state budget. And can everyone see the slides now? And next slide. I'll start with funding specifically for COVID-19 related relief, focusing on the emergency rental assistance program. And I'll quickly go over what's in the budget for housing and homelessness outside of pandemic relief. Next slide. The largest relief program is the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, or ERAP. Maryland got $402 million in funding from the December stimulus package, divided between funding that flows through DHCD and some that goes directly to the largest eight local jurisdictions. The program was expanded in the American Rescue Plan, giving Maryland a total of more than $750 million in available funds. The program can cover either rent or utility arrears for up to 12 months of assistance, plus prospective assistance up to three months. The assistance is available to renters with household income at or below 80% of area median income who can demonstrate hardship due to COVID-19. Jurisdictions can also use some of the funding for housing stability services, including legal assistance. Uh, next slide, please. DHCD passed most of its allocation for the first round of ERAP through to local programs, and the locals are in the process of making rental assistance payments from this first round of funding. I won't spend long on the slide as I'm sure the department will wanna talk about their dashboard showing the program's progress. I've included a link to the dashboard in the slides where you can filter the data by county as well as by state directed or local funds. And you can also see some demographic information on recipients. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes other housing funding made available through the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan totaling $475 million. In the interest of time, I won't go into detail on these programs, but I'm happy to follow up offline if anyone wants to know more. Uh, the funding for the CARES Act programs has already been spent on rental assistance or has been allocated to local jurisdictions and continuums of care uh, for rental assistance, as well as other needs such as rapid rehousing. Plans for most of the American Rescue Plan funds are still in development. Next slide. Finally, this slide shows the funding for relevant programs in the fiscal 2022 state operating and capital budgets. This includes $10.6 million for the Homelessness Solutions Program and DHCD. Uh, this is level funded from the prior year, including $1 million for grants under the Ending Youth Homelessness Act. The operating budget also includes more than $270 million for rental subsidies, and the capital budget provides nearly $80 million for the creation of affordable housing units, as well as $3 million for shelter and transitional housing projects. In addition to these slides, the meeting materials also include a handout summarizing relevant enacted and proposed legislation from this past session. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Okay, do we see, does anybody have any questions? I'm looking for the little hands. Okay, I don't see any questions. Um, I, I do have- Oh, sorry, go ahead, Delegate Wilkins, please. I didn't get to my my hand quick enough. Um, yes, thank you so much for the presentation, Emily. I just wanted to make sure I understood. I think I saw something quickly there that said, did it say 100 million out of the 400 million has been distributed? And can you say more about just the timeline and getting the, the rest of that out? And that's all going to the local jurisdiction, is that correct? Most of it is going uh, through the local jurisdiction program. Some of it, the Department of Housing and Community Development is uh, distributing through the Assisted Housing Relief Program for multifamily properties. But yes, it's $100 million. The data I was showing is as of the end of July, uh, and the, the funding has been ramping up, uh, getting out the door more quickly over time. Uh, and the department may also, they're presenting next and may also be able to provide more up-to-date data. Do you have anything further, Delegate Wilkins? Is that good? No, thank you so much, Emily. Um, so I think what we see here at committee is generally, um, we know that this is a significant issue on so many fronts and that we need significant amounts of money. And this is the first time we've had significant amounts of money um, because of the pandemic money and the federal money. And what we're looking to is to see if it's being spent and how it's being spent um, so that our recommendations to the speaker can um, you know, be formatted in a fashion. But what I think the Senator and I have seen in our reports consistently is we are not um, pleased with the fact that it continues to be level funded um, each year. And we have consistently made recommendations to the Senate and the House leadership that um, level funding, you know, even pre-pandemic was not sufficient and only allowed us to fall further behind in a lot of these programs. Um, so with that, we try also with our recommendations to look at a lot of regulatory stuff and other things that we can do um, to try to get some immediate relief in this area that don't involve um, as much funding because our recommendations always say we need more. Senator Washington. Well, I really believe Delegate Krim had her hand up first. Oh, sorry, I didn't there see that. I'm not seeing hands, I'm sorry. <laughs> Delegate Krim. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Washington. So um, uh, to Emily, um, what we're hearing a lot on the news is, is that this money is not getting uh, to people who need it. So uh, do we know how programs are going in all the counties? Are they reporting their data? Um, has any of the counties or have you, your department at Legislative Services developed uh, best practices on, on these funds? Uh, because we all know that the best way to stop homelessness is for people not to become homeless to be. So, and that's what these funds are designed to do. They're designed to keep people in their homes. So, uh, and, and I think we're, we're failing at this somewhat. We're not getting the money that's there out to the individuals that need it. So can you comment on that, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, the dashboard that DHCD uh, has on their website does include a county, a county by county breakdown. You can filter by county uh, to see how much each county has been allocated and how much they've distributed. Uh, as far as best practices, DLS doesn't have any, but there are several national groups, uh, such as the Urban Institute and others that have developed best practices, and I can send you some information on that if you would like. All right, thank you. Thank you, Delegate Krim. And I think that there's also, we are hearing the inconsistencies between the counties um, and the speed at which some of the counties are operating and some are not. So we'll probably reach out to MAKO um, to see if we can get more information as the interim goes on. Delegate Lehman. Sorry, Senator, I'm assuming you just wanted me to finish with the delegates. Well, I, I actually did have a question, but de um, the, let Delegate Lehman go first. And I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, Delegate Lehman. Thank, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair. I, 
Um, so I have a, a follow up question about, um, and this is based on a briefing that the Environment and Transportation Committee got, I believe it was back in June from DHCD on uh, ERAP funding and how various counties were doing. Um, I, you know, I was pleased to hear at that time that actually Prince George's was was leading the state in getting those funds out the door um, and into uh, renters' hands but or, or landlords, whichever was the case. Um, but there was a comment from um, the assistant secretary that there was some concern with, um, you know, the, the struggles in some jurisdictions where it was taking um, up to mo several months to even process applications. Uh, and with the end of the federal fiscal year being September 30th, there was some concern around whether the feds might take back this money if if the state doesn't spend it, which, um, you know, needless to say, the members of ENT found alarming. Is there any update on that? Um, you know, any concern about those funds being taken back um, by the federal government if they're not either all spent or mostly spent or we're not being more efficient about spending them? Uh, yes, there still is the, the requirement, well, the guidance that 65% of the funds, if they're not committed by the end of September, that the Treasury can redistribute them to other grantees. Uh, in terms of the progress towards meeting that goal, uh, since the most up-to-date data I have is from the end of July, I don't know if there's um, how close we are now to meeting those goals and how close each jurisdiction is. And is that is that sixty five percent a statewide number or a, a, an average, a median? It's not by county. How does that? What does the sixty five percent figure mean? That's concerning. It's sixty five percent of the uh, state directed funds, and then for each of the jurisdictions that receive direct allocation, it would also apply to that direct allocation. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, when we get DCHD up, they might be able to add more. Senator Washington. Thank you. Um, again, Emily, thank you for that, that pithy but brief report. I, I'm going to ask you to delve into some of the, uh, pa the legislation uh, that we passed last session, uh, particularly uh, the relevant uh, provisions of the Relief Act. Uh, that have to that address homelessness. Could you could you discuss that that and then also could you also talk a little bit about um, residential tenants access to counsel? Could you talk to you talk about those two bills? Yes, I know the Relief Act provided fifteen million dollars for emergency housing to DHCD, um, and I would have to double check on if all of that has been expended. It's all been allocated to the continuums of care, but DHCD once again would have uh, the most up-to-date information on that. Um, and then if I could appeal to one of my co-staff, um, if you could answer the question on the uh, House Bill 18. Well, also, could you could you tell us a little bit about the Maryland Legal Services? I think that there are some okay. components. Yeah. They received some funding. Um, for legal assistance, and I believe they were waiting to uh, make awards from that funding until the eviction moratorium expired, and I would need to uh, reach out to them to get an update on okay. the status of that. That would, that would be great. And then, yeah, if anyone could talk with us about the residential, uh, uh, you know, chapter 746, access to counsel. Uh, yeah, I can jump in. So chapter 746 of this last session establishes, these are key words, subject to the availability of funding, access to legal representations for individuals meeting specific requirements and specific landlord-tenant proceedings. So when access to counsel and evictions program is established, it will be administered by MLSC, and they're going to organize and direct services and resources um, to provide legal representation. The bill also establishes a task force and a special fund to be administered by MLSC for the purpose of providing funding to fully implement the legal representation and evictions and other related proceedings in the state. And um, the access to legal representation by the bill must be phased in over time as determined appropriate by MLSC with the goal of being fully implemented before October 1st, 2025. 
And the bill also makes some procedural changes and failure to pay rent cases by requiring landlords to provide written notice to tenants prior to filing a complaint in the district court. Thank you. I, I wanted to raise that on the record for everyone because that's going to be a part of our discussion. And, and I guess the final one would be uh, the work group on adaptive reuse. Um, so Elgar, could you talk about that a little bit? Um, that's an important, that was one of the recommendations of our committee. Pardon me for one moment as I pull up the bill. Uh, oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. Thank you. I could have told you ahead of time. Um, all good. And then also just committee, we there's a number of bills that were pro proposed but didn't pass. And I think that that's something that the, the co-chair and I and the, just we as a committee, if we could look at those pieces of legislation uh, and see if there are some of them that we want to revisit, um, uh, particularly when we're looking at the eviction and housing relief and uh, you know some of our cooperative housing and mixed housing. There's a number of, of bills that uh, some of you have put in or our colleagues have put in on, on the area of, of ending homelessness that that we could be advocating for and recommending. Uh, All right. So for the adaptive work group for adaptive reuse of vacant commercial spaces, chapter 584 of 2021, uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development must provide staff for the work group. Uh, work group, uh, the uh, work group must report its findings by November 30th, 2021, to the governor and the General Assembly. And the work group must study, among other things, uh, the feasibility and limitations of converting vacant and underutilized commercial spaces into residential or mixed use residential and commercial spaces in order to increase the availability of affordable housing stock in the state, identify the sources of state funds available to developers interested in developing affordable housing by converting existing commercial spaces into specified residential or mixed use spaces, including any conditions on the receipt and use of those funds, identify and study any programs developed by other states for the purpose of converting vacant commercial spaces into affordable housing, and make recommendations regarding legislation necessary to facilitate the conversion of vacant or underutilized commercial spaces into residential or mixed use residential and commercial spaces. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Madam Co-Chair for that. Um, and again, that you notice we on that committee, that bill, uh, we have a quick turnaround and so we need to, to get this up. So we're looking forward uh, to getting um, uh, house members uh, appointed to that committee so we can, we can move forward. Um, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, next, we're gonna have uh, Department of Housing and Community Development. We have Stuart Campbell here. And for those of you in the audience and those new members, you know, we wanna let you know that Mr. Campbell has worked long and hard with us um, on many issues, both during the hearings, but behind the scenes. And we know he's got a full plate and we always appreciate uh, his attention to us and the needs uh, that we have. And we know he's anxious to get that adaptive reuse committee going. Mr. Campbell. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good to see you and Senator Washington and the other members of the committee, as always. Um, I think my slide, uh, is, slide deck is coming up. Uh, while we're doing that, I will just uh, mention I'm, I'm delighted to see Delegate Wilkins on. She is actually my delegate. Uh, and I know she has been committed to this uh, work for some time and been doing some great work. Um, okay, so uh, if you go to the next slide, and actually this is just me, so we can skip that one. Um, so these are the things I'm going to touch on today, and I got uh, a, a little bit of a preview of the anticipated questions. Um, and uh, Emily actually stole some of my thunder because some of the information she provided I'll also be touching on, but we can skip over it fairly quickly. But we're gonna talk about the Homelessness Solutions uh, Program as well as the Ending Youth Homelessness Act funds for this year. We just made the awards a couple months ago. I wanted to just update the committee on that. Um, I'm just gonna briefly touch on the CARES Act funding and then spend the rest of the discussion on the uh, ERAP program. So, so let's go to the next slide. Um, nope, you're fine. Go to the next slide. And so, uh, as you all know, we allocate over 10.4 million. We're appropriated 10.6, but we do have uh, a couple smaller programs like a, a statewide data warehouse and some things that we utilize the funds for. Um, but we uh, award the funds to the uh, 12 um, 
uh, COCs of Maryland. I'm not sure, uh, delegates and senators, is my slide deck cut off for you as well or just me? It is cut off. It's cut off. Got it. I, okay. Well, it may be because uh, our template is widescreen, but um, I'll, I'll do my best to fill in the blanks of what you're seeing. Um, so maybe I'm not sure if the... And I do think at another hearing later on, we have the, someone from the Continuum on Cares coming in. Great. Great. So uh, what I was saying, and I'll just uh, update folks while we're waiting for the slide deck to come back. Um, so those funds uh, are awarded to the 12 Continuums of Care. The continu Continuums of Care are the uh, federally mandated structure within each state. Uh, there's about 400 of them across the country. Maryland has 12 now. We had 16, but uh, DHCD is now the lead agency, uh, COC agency for a number of uh, counties. Um, these funds support shelter operations, um, street outreach, prevention, rapid rehousing. Those are the uh, ones that I'm sure you're all familiar. That's the uh, programs that HUD uh, supports and um, that we basically match um, the same uh, strategies and support uh, the COCs with the little supplemental uh, um, appropriations. Um, a, mil a minimum of one million is dedicated each year to provide youth with case management, youth programs with case management, wrapper housing, street, street outreach and other supportive services. And then last year we received approximately uh, 13.5 million in additional federal funds for homelessness services, which was part of the CARES Act. Uh, and those were distributed to the non-entitlement COCs. The entitlement COCs are the ones um, that uh, received direct allocation from HUD. So we can go to the next slide. This is just a couple snapshots of the funding that was made. The awards were made uh, in effective July 1st of this year. Um, these were the uh, eight or nine uh, COCs that were awarded funds. Uh, and then the next slide is the actual uh, balance of, oh, go back one, if we could. <laughs> Um, the uh, Allegheny County through uh, Washington County, those are the, the COCs that I mentioned, and these are the funding levels that we've made um, to each and every one of them. Um, these are the supplemental awards that we got through the CARES Act. About 13.5 million was distributed um, in two tranches. The first was uh, just 1 million or about 1 million. Uh, or 4 million, I'm sorry, I'm trying to recall. It's been a few months. Uh, and then the remaining 10 million was uh, allocated in the second tranche. Um, and actually they're right there on the, the totals at, along the bottom. Um, so um, the Emergency Solutions Grant CARES Act funds can be used for street outreach, emergency shelter, essentially the same things that our regular COC funding can be used for. Um, we do encourage the COCs to be used um, as a last resort for prevention funding, which is uh, because there are so many other funds that I'll go into that were available for uh, prevention um, and uh, can only uh, should only be used when CRF, uh, coronavirus relief funds, and CDBG funds have been maximized. The priorities for the first tranche were to decompress shelters. We wanted to obviously during the beginning of the pandemic, move as many folks out of uh, congregate settings uh, and move them into hotel, motel, alternate sites, uh, more permanent housing placements. Uh, they also uh, wanted us to use the funds to help provide uh, PPE, screening materials, cleaning supplies, physical barriers, that kind of thing. For uh, the, the second tranche, the priorities were to maintain and further reduce any congregate shelter populations and then rapidly increase permanent housing placements. These funds are actually available through the end of September of 2022. Uh, so we still have a, a year to go um, and we're hopeful and believe that we will see a significant increase in uh, permanent housing placements uh, by utilizing these funds. I will say that uh, pre-pandemic, we um, 
we were actually seeing a trending down over the uh, five years up through uh, the 2020 uh, point in time count. There was about a 24% reduction in overall homelessness in Maryland. And I believe that is attributable, attributable to the fact that uh, so many of our COCs have uh, really ramped up strategies like rapid rehousing, uh, prevention, things like that. So those are the the strategies are working, uh, which is really what I, I think is important to underscore. Uh, because of the nature of the pandemic and the fact that a lot of uh, individuals who are homeless um, are spread out uh, and are decentralized right now, it's it's been a little harder to actually conduct uh, a, a 2021 point in time count. In fact, HUD did not require it this year because uh, they also did not want to put individuals into situations where they would be interacting with individuals, uh, you know, in, in a group setting or things like that. So they, uh, there, there will not be a really great 2021 point in time count. Um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, I am going to now talk about the emergency rental assistance program. So go ahead and uh, move to the next slide. Um, I think before we talk too much about it, I think it's really important to understand that prior to ERAP, uh, we made um, about $100 million, $113 million available for rental assistance through a number of sources. So ERAP is the program that everyone is talking about right now, um, but I, I really cannot underscore enough that uh, the local jurisdictions had $113 million prior to that to use exclusively for rental assistance. And we know that uh, through August, they have spent about 100 million of that. The next two lines are ERAP1 and ERAP2. Uh, the EREP run directing uh, direct awards to the eight largest jurisdictions. Um, so 143.5 million was awarded directly to the eight largest jurisdictions. And I'm sure you can imagine which ones those are. Um, we know that through this, this slide is a, a little bit um, uh, out of date, but um, we these were numbers that we uh, sort of uh, anticipated would be spent through by the end of August cumulatively. Um, unfortunately, we do not yet have August numbers. Uh, they are due to the U.S. Treasury on the 15th of every month. We require all of the jurisdictions to submit them to us on the 8th of every month. So they came in yesterday and we just simply have not had time to pull anything together uh, with any certainty. So um, if uh, we, so we will be updating our, our um, dashboard in a week or so uh, with the, the latest numbers. Uh, if we can go to the, the next slide, um, these are the two uh, allocations. As Emily mentioned, the uh, ERAP-1 was awarded through the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Maryland received $401.5 million. This is again the allocation between the local jurisdictions and um, Mar uh, and the state. Uh, and ERAP two, there is an additional 352 million that's coming that has come to Maryland. Um, 204 million was awarded to the state of Maryland uh, for statewide use, and 148 again was awarded to the eight counties with over 200 resident 200,000 residents. Next slide. So these are the general requirements of ERAP. It can be used for rental and utility costs incurred by a tenant after March 13th, 2020. Uh, it can be utilized for up to 12 months of arrears uh, and well as three months of prospective. If there is a mixture of ERAP-1 and ERAP-2 funds, it can go up to 18 month total uh, assistance. So three more months of prospective. Unfortunately, in the statute, it is limited to 12 months arrears. Um, and I know that's even troubling for the U.S. Treasury. They are would probably change that if they could, but that would require an act of Congress. Um, tenants must be at or below 80% of the area median income. The priority is for those who are at 50% of AMI or who have been unemployed for over 90 days at time of application. And then finally, tenants must experience financial hardship related to COVID either directly or indirectly. Now, one thing that I wanna point out is that um, 
uh, initially, the financial hardship could be um, confirmed through self-attestation, um, but the Treasury did require that income had to be determined through backup documentation, things like that, unless um, after due diligence of about seven days or so, uh, they were not able to obtain the appropriate documentation. One thing that is uh, uh, just came out last week from the US Treasury is that they now say that income can also be self-attested if the documentation is not available. So we are, um, we were pleased with that because uh, our hope is that will help to really streamline the funding getting out the door. And I think that's part of the challenge of the funds moving is because it did require a, a substantial um, uh, effort to obtain the income documentation. If we can go to the next slide. Um, this is a graphic representation of the ERAP-1 funds, each of the jurisdictions. I know you have it in front of you or you should have gotten a copy, so we can skip over this. Uh, I'm already seeing hands raised for questions. This is our marketing and outreach. Um, the uh, over 9 million online advertisement views have been uh, have happened. Um, 5,400 radio and TV commercials have aired, 570,000 direct mail postcards. Um, it gives you a breakdown of the, uh, of the different uh, sources. Over 17,000 calls have come into our call center and our ERAP uh, website is uh, seeing a significant amount of of views. And I'm told that given that the average time on the page is 404 minutes, it's, uh, that means they're really spending time there. The next slide shows our actual outreach for culturally uh, specific uh, populations. Um, we've had um, 96,000 collaterals distributed. A lot of that is through just simply door knocking. Um, we've had radio advertisements and live radio, social media impressions, virtual events, all of this specifically targeted to both the African-American community and the Hispanic community. If um, we go to the next slide, um, this is uh, the image that Emily had on our screen. This is from our dashboard. Um, I'll spend a couple of minutes here. And again, this is only through the end of July. Um, we know that over 9,800 households have been served uh, through the end of July, um, and uh, about 100 million in either payments just uh, distributed directly or um, through, that were in process at the end of July. Uh, you'll see that um, the uh, expenditure rates have dramatically increased over the last several months. Um, I think part of it was just uh, trying to pull together a, a massive program in a relatively short period of time. Uh, but um, we are encouraged by the fact that our, uh, I think our, our July numbers were something like five times uh, than uh, previous months put together. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I don't think I have any more, very many more. In fact, this is my last substantive one. The rent relief Maryland, uh, .maryland gov is the website that anyone should go to if they uh, are in need of rental assistance that will provide information on every single county in the city of Baltimore and how to, how to apply. Or they can call our call center at the number below. Um, so that's my testimony, and I'm more than happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, before I ask any questions, let me see if any of the committee members have questions. Do we have. Okay. I think you know, if you don't mind, I just I just want to ask. I guess go to back to slide 17, uh, and I thank you, Stuart, as always, uh, Mr. Campbell. That the, the um, dollar amount that we're putting out is definitely increased, but I just want to look at the need you get 27,000 sure you know, these 27,000 individual applications these are all from different people right and so so just so I can understand what that means because it looks like 
Yeah. Only about a third of the need is is being is able based on the funding that we currently. Well, have. so I want to keep it. I want to underscore that that just because they weren't approved does not mean it. They weren't denied. That they were denied. So some of these, uh, I think we what we're looking for is the dashboard uh, slide, yeah. which is slide seventeen. There we go. Yeah. Oh, one one back. So. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so Yes, it's, it's okay. Everyone knows what we're talking about. Yes, we're talking about... Uh, <laughs> 27,000 applications. Yeah, so 27,000 applications uh, had been submitted. Some of those may be duplicates because oh, okay. one of the challenges is that a lot of jurisdictions, for instance, um, Baltimore County had something like six or 8,000 applications. And so... Um, and remember, I mentioned that there was about 100 million, 113 million available uh, prior to ERAP. And so there were different programs that had already been set up. And as they ran out of money, some of those applications were held. Uh -huh. And so they did reopen the programs when they received ERAP funds. Uh, but I think what happened is people seeing that rental assistance is available or seeing the ads, they may have applied again. Okay. It's possible some of them, yeah. one, some of them were uh, yeah. possibly duplicates. Another is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, there is, uh, there was a fairly stringent income verification requirement. Right. right. Um, and so that did slow them up. And so these applications, the 26,000, um, a lot of them were still in process right. when at the end of July. So a number of these applications will be approved, will have been approved in August. Uh, and then, um, you know, they'll work through them as they go along. So it's, it, we're yeah. definitely not seeing 27,000 denied. Right. So how about just prior, if you could prior to our next meeting, maybe uh, unpack some of that, like, so that we could just get a, a good sense, like, that's a good number, but if we could unpack that. And then another, this is a request, you don't have to, you know, answer it, uh, because of time. But on, on slide 11, under pandemic related rental assistance, um, I'd like to, um, get that get the numbers just for the federal dollars, I think it was kind of relumping uh, the local, state, and federal dollars together. So if we can have all the federal money from so the... Almost all federal money. So, okay, so it's all federal it's money. Almost all. There may have been a few counties. I think Montgomery County may have put a little bit okay. of their own money in, but for the most part, it's almost all federal. Okay, okay, all right, great. So just going forward, let's just sort of, again, because we're, we're the, the state committee and we, we, we're appreciating this influx of... Uh, federal dollars, but it's also the case that we've been concerned about trying to increase what our, our state is contributing. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We're going to do try to keep questions a little brief because we can always get to Mr. Campbell individually. Delegate Lehman. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so just briefly, I was wondering if you could um, help me understand whether there is a single pot of money for both landlords and tenants, or, or how, how does that work? So the ERAP program is uh, designed to only help tenants. Um, and of course, by paying the rent, they will be helping the landlords, of course. Uh, but within the federal statute is a requirement that a tenant at least be involved. If there is no tenant involved, or a tenant does not sign a document that they are applying for the funds, then unfortunately the landlord cannot be paid. Um, they did loosen some restrictions uh, related to if a tenant has moved out, um, that is now allowable in certain circumstances. If it's preventing the tenant from accessing a, you know, a new rental property, uh, then the, the previous landlord can have their you know, arrearages made whole, but it does count towards that 12 month total. Okay, okay. And then um, did I see correctly that uh, a tenant can potentially be eligible for up to 12 months of uh, um, rental assistance for prospective rent, not that they've fallen behind, no. over, but prospectively can get help, is that right? No, it's, it's 12 months of arrears. So anything okay. you know in the past, 
The ERAP one allows for up to three months of prospective rent, and ERAP two would allow up to eight uh, of up to six months of prospective rent, but it has to be um, every three months has to be reconfirmed. So after the okay. first three months, they have to at least they have to determine to be eligible still to receive the second three months. Great. And then last quick question is, can any of the e money be used for relocation assistance? Um, that's a great question. And I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. Uh, I yeah, I've been asked that by a couple of uh, constituents who are in very, you know, on on um, desirable situations and would really like to be able to move, but can't afford to do so. In one case, it's an eviction case from a mobile home park. Okay. Um, and, and the person doesn't have the, you know, owns his own trailer, but doesn't have the funds to relocate anywhere. So that would be helpful to get an answer to. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Ellis. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, uh, Ms. Campbell, thank you for your graphs and your testimony, uh, quite uh, a lot of information is packed in there. I have a couple quick questions. Um, the first one is like, I noticed for like outreach, your outreach slide, uh, you talked about, uh, especially like saying different markets. Uh, you mentioned one interview in um, Baltimore, Larry King, so I know that's the Baltimore area. Uh, is there any similar outreach like in the Washington market? Uh, stations uh, as far as uh, any data on that or you can uh, off the top of your head? Possibly. Our, our outreach, I, I can ask our outreach people. Um, we have a whole department that handles that side of things. They, they actually prepare this slide, so I don't know, uh, but I'll see what I can find out. If you could please uh, see what um, I represent, of course, Charles County and we're in the DC market. And so I'm not, I'm, I want to make sure that uh, in this market, our constituents are getting the information also. So I just wanna kind of do that. So if you could follow up with me with that. And the second question I have, uh, you have uh, for the uh, jurisdictions under 200,000 uh, population uh, funds uh, administered through your department and, and to the counties. So for my county, you have it lumped in with uh, St. Mary's and Calvert County. And so um, which agency, I mean, because um, I know there's a Tri-County Council. I'm, I'm not, I didn't hear that they were handling these sure. funds. So when you lump them together like that, is there a particular, they go to like Tri-County or uh, do you have that information where it actually goes? Yeah, so it's um, each, uh, each amount of funds were given directly to the county government. Um, so Charles Calvert and St. Mary's all receive their separate allocation. And for reference, that slide 14, it shows the exact ones. Um, now, I, what I don't have is whether or not some of them subgrant. Almost all of them are subgranting some funds to local providers. And I know uh, Tri-County Community Action mm -hmm. is one of the subgrantees, but, but there are a number, uh, several in, in that area. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so so quick follow up, uh, Madam Chair. So when you say Southern Maryland, um, you just kind of didn't want to break it out into Charles Calvert and St. Mary's. You just put that together. No, you may have been. So you may have been looking at our balance of uh, our continuum of care funding. Um, the this is so there. There's homelessness solutions program, which is yeah. awarded to continuums of care, mm -hmm. and in in um, the, the one the continuum of care that covers Charles Calvert and St. Mary's is, is a single one. So it's, that's designated by the federal government. The ERAP funds are awarded to each jurisdiction. So I think you, you may uh, have seen the um, HSP slide and thought it was uh, yeah. ERAP. Okay, yeah, and that's uh, very important for me. Um, I hosted a uh, homelessness forum uh, after my first uh, meeting, um, 2019, of course, nothing last year. And I was shocked to hear that a lot of the funds that went to uh, the continuum of care, most of the money was spent in like Calvert and St. Mary's County and very little came to Charles County. And this was information from our 
social services director. <laughs> and so it was shocking. And so I need to, I'll follow up with you to see basically Please. where those funds flows, even when they go through the, these different organizations. So thank you for sure. your time, sir. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator. Sen Delegate Krim. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Can I ask, if is the state being proactive on any of this? Like, are we sending out perhaps postcards to people who get food stamps, for example, uh, to let them know that these programs exist and how they can get this funding? Thank you. So we, what we did is we actually looked at uh, census tracts and identified low income census tracts as defined by the U.S. Census. And that's where we sent out over 570,000 postcards. And, and to Senator Ellis's point, that was statewide. It covered every jurisdiction uh, in, in the state. Um, our, our Facebook ads, our um, radio and television, all of those uh, have less ability to be specifically targeted unless you're talking about specific uh, like African-American stations or Hispanic radio. Uh, but we, we intentionally target all of our postcards to go to um, census, low income census track areas. Thank you. So, all right, I'm gonna do a quick follow up because we're approaching the, the hour mark. Um, so just as a follow up with Delegate Cram, I think what she's suggesting, because we sit in appropriations and hear all the budgets. So we know that we have all of the agencies talking to this population to the extent they can. And obviously if you're homeless, a postcard's really hard. Um, and in shelters, I'm sure it's really hard to get the postcard. Um, and, you know, then you have to recognize that the postcard is important because how much of us look at our mail and just right. sort through it, but that they do receive communication very specifically in the areas um, of DHS and, me and Medicaid in the Department of Mental Health, DHS in the um, foster care and the families and in our workforce programs where people actually have to be in communication with a person. And so I think what the good delegate Krim is suggesting is that the communication be coordinated with the people that are seeing and have to see these constituents either live or by telephone um, rather than just kind of low census income, I mean, census track mailings. Um, so just quickly on the slide, if you could send back to us that indicates that there was 10.4 million, and this is what I think that Senator Ellis was looking at, to the 12 continuums of care. If we could get back more specific geographic information on those continuums of care and the allocation of the 10.4 million, and then for the non-entitlement COCs, because I think even myself having done this as long as I have, I did not realize that, that there were areas that were not picked up by the continuums of care. I think the general understanding that I had was that the continuums of care pick up all of the different geographic areas as the federal funding's flowing through. And so really the 13.5 million, which is you know, 3 million more going to non-entitlement COCs, where is that going? And geographically, how is that money being spent? Sure. I, just real quickly, there are COCs that cover the entire state. Uh, so I, I just want to be clear. And our HSP program does award funds to all, all COCs. Um, the uh, additional funds that we received under the CARES Act, the 13.4, um, th that, that was only permitted to go to the, the non-entitlement areas because the entitlement jurisdictions, I think they got something like about 30 million of their own funds from the same pot. Um, those funds just didn't pass through the state. They came directly from the feds. If you could help send us a visual so that we can see geographically what we're dealing with in terms of the continuum of care, the 10 million, and then the 13 million in the non-entitlement and where that went so we can see geographically um, the flow of the money would be helpful. And then um, I know we've got to wrap up here. Are you concerned at all on the chart 
um, that shows how much total money has been spent. I think we just want to be clear. We're seeing less than half of it um, spent when that money expires. Is that all? We still have another year in that? or So we have uh, until the end of, of September um, in, to hit the 65% mark, or as Emily said, Ms. Haskell said that um, Treasury may recapture funds. However, I will say this, on calls that I've been on with Treasury, what they've indicated is that if they see jurisdictions or states making an effort and seeing a, you know, an increase of, of things going out the door, they're highly unlikely to take those funds away. Uh, they're oh. really looking at places, um, and I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but I think Iowa didn't, or Idaho didn't create a, any ERAP program and didn't spend anything. New York took many, many months, and I'm not even sure it's up and running now either. So those are the states that are at risk, significantly at risk. Thank you. Then if, before we finish our work in the interim, if you can let us know then in November, you know, beginning of December, Oh, absolutely. If any money. And, and if you could let us know before then, when you're looking at the 62.9 and the 46.9, if there's any particular jurisdictions that are of concern to the agency, that we at least know what those jurisdictions are so that we can talk to our leadership in the House and the Senate um, about those concerns. And then just a quick final question. When you talk about utility relief, do we have anything in here that includes relief with water? Or is this just electric? No, water and in fact, um, electric, uh, gas, sewer, water, and internet actually, believe it or not, is eligible for um, assistance through- Okay, internet. so under utility, water is included. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Cam oh, I see Senator Ellis. Did you leave your hand up or are you back again? Oh, you're muted, um, Thank you. Uh, quick question, Madam Chair, thank you for this. Uh, so uh, on your chart with eligibility and priority going to folks who make under a certain amount of dollars. So what is that basis for that income? Um, so if, is it like taxes, tax return from year last year, two years, uh, or because someone that's laid off now, they have that old in, uh, income tax statement, that old income. So really quick, uh, what's that based on please? Uh, their most recent couple of pay subs um, and if they, they're unemployed, any unemployment uh, show, you know, being demonstrated. But as I mentioned, um, the US Treasury just last week announced that uh, people can self attest that they qualify okay. uh, for the program now. Great. That's great decision policy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And, and Mr. Campbell, just send us back what is being considered 80% of AMI and 50% um, of AMI so that we just have a general sense of the. Figures. Um, we have a lot on the agenda, but we do tend to give DHCD a little bit more because oh. he's got not that not to say that any of the others coming before us don't. But um, we're going to move on to the office of the attorney general. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Um, and we have Layla Tulin here. Layla, you want to try to go and, and hold your your briefing to just less than 15 minutes. And if, if I could, uh, Madam Co-Chair, could we maybe hear both the eviction report, almost like they're a panel, and then we have our questions for both of them. That way they each give their presentation um, and then maybe, and then do the evictions and. Sure, so you're saying not go on with the Office of the Attorney General, but go to the eviction lab first? No, have them do the Office of the Attorney General and then just go right into the. Into the eviction lab yeah. and then we'll take questions. Yeah. Okay, yeah. terrific. That's why you're the Senator, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Ms. Uh, Tulin. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I wanna make sure that everybody can hear me because uh, in these remote times, I wanna be sensitive and make sure that my technology is working. Uh, so I'll look for um, a thumbs up. Uh, thank you. So my name is Leah Tulin. I'm a special assistant to the attorney general and uh, on behalf of the Attorney General and our office, I want to thank uh, the co-chairs and the committee for uh, inviting us to participate in today's briefing. I will try to be brief. I know that we uh, are short on time. So uh, 
I am going to focus on uh, state eviction trends and responses and uh, sort of best practices that um, we have identified going forward. And I will go quickly through my slides um, as most of them speak for themselves. So it's important, and this committee knows that when we're talking about uh, the pandemic, we have to back up and understand that the landscape before the pandemic was, uh, we're now in crisis, we were arguably in crisis before that. And so the statistics on, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. The statistics on these, uh, this slide are from uh, the Maryland District Court reports. And I'll come back at some point, if I have time, to the problem that we have with data. And I suspect that um, the, uh, the um, panelists from, uh, from the Eviction Lab can speak to this too. But one of the issues that we have is that we don't have great data that really talk to exactly what's going on on the ground. But what we know is that before the pandemic, there were uh, a ton, almost uh, on average, 643,000 landlord tenant cases that were filed in district courts on a yearly basis. Um, the number that the court reports reflect of evictions are dwarfed by the failure to pay rent filings. And I focus on failure to pay rent filings because they're the, the vast majority of eviction filings. Um, you know, they, the, they dwarf that, and that speaks, I think, to two points. The first is that, um, well, first of all, I'll just say this, so based on data immediately leading up to uh, the pandemic, which we sort of start thinking about as March 2020, there were approximately 1,800 court recorded evictions on a monthly basis. That translates to approximately 21,600 per year, um, which is too many because we know that that translates to households and families that are impacted. Um, but th that doesn't even tell the full story because what it doesn't speak to is those are essentially where the court the, and the sheriff's office ultimately intervene. But what we know is that many tenants, when they receive a complaint or a summons, don't realize that there might be rental assistance available. There may have, they may well have a defense available to them uh, and they simply move out or self-evict. And so uh, that 1800 a month is the best that we have, but it's almost certainly an understatement of uh, orders of magnitude. The other thing, and we can move to the next slide, is that the, the data on the previous slide really speaks to the fact that we have a serial eviction filing problem in Maryland. And I'm, I am hopeful that uh, our friend from the eviction lab will speak to this because our best data comes from them, which is also, again, based on the Maryland District Court reports. But uh, the fi if you calculate the filing rate, the eviction filing rate pre-pandemic, which is the number of landlord tenant cases filed in a given year divided by the number of total rental households across the state, Maryland was somewhere in the, in the 80% versus a national average of 6%. And what that speaks to is that the, um, the landlords are using the courts to, as a first resort and essentially as a way to collect debt. There, most of the people who are getting uh, serially filed on are not getting evicted through the court process, but some of them, going back to what I was saying about um, self-eviction, some of them are, uh, are, are self-evicting because they are getting notices that suggest and that they may not understand uh, are, are not necessarily, um, won't lead to eviction, so they move out on their own. Um, the other thing to flag about the pre-pandemic state of affairs is that uh, it, for a variety of reasons, there are, um, which lack of tenant education, enforcement resources, and weak tenant protections, there are numerous circumstances in which landlords can get away with charging illegal fees, not maintaining their properties, 
not returning security deposits, and tenants end up getting evicted or self-evicting when they actually, in fact, owe very little, if anything, in rent. And so that sets the stage for the pandemic. And I just will briefly note that this is something that um, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Community and Economic Development at the Treasury Department, Noel Poyo, in a White House eviction prevention webinar really put very well. He said, it doesn't have to be a reality for low income people regularly facing eviction for small sums of money. And so I'll transition now, we can go to the next slide to, um, to talking about what has happened in the pandemic and what the data shows. But I think what I'll try and focus on as quickly as I can is that we obviously have a crisis right now and there are best practices and there, there really is an opportunity to, um, to be creative and innovative and uh, make it so that things are not only um, that we avert the crisis that we're facing now, but that we institute practices and policies that improve things even from the pre-pandemic state of affairs. So this is a slide, this is taken from um, the census, which started collecting survey data on a regular basis. And basically what it shows is that uh, the there are many Maryland households that are behind on rent. And that has been the case since the beginning of the pandemic when the Census Bureau started collecting the data. And it, you can see the trend is that it is starting to go down. Um, and presumably, or hopefully that is as the um, rental assistance picks up and the distribution of it becomes more efficient, but there's still a significant number of Maryland households who are uh, facing arrears. This, I don't have this on a slide, but you can look at the census data and I'm happy to put it together for you. Maryland and the, um, the uh, National Equity Atlas has been compiling this data. Maryland, the percentage of Maryland households that are facing arrears has often outstrips the national average. I think right now we are just about at the average, but we've been above average at numerous times during the pandemic. Um, the next slide, which I, we can just speed through, basically is just a different way of looking at this. It's the total um, number of households. And I think the key takeaway is that, again, we're going in the right direction, but there are over 100,000 Maryland households who are behind on rent. And the key, and I'll start talking a little bit about the eviction moratoria, the state, federal and state protections that have been in place, but those are no longer in place. And so all of those 100,000 plus households are now in immediate risk of eviction. There are some landlords um, and the landlord groups that have said, well, it's fine because the, the courts are so backlogged that, you know, the rental assistance can get out the door uh, before these cases actually get called. Um, you know, even if that's true, which I think it's not entirely true, we know that because of self-evictions, because of the lack of knowledge that um, some of the people who are eligible for rental assistance funds and other challenges uh, that some of these families will likely lose their homes unless we uh, take action. So, um, and we also know, I mean, this committee well knows that the disproportionate number of households that are at risk of eviction are women and people of color and that many of them have children living in them. And so the stakes are high, which this committee knows, and I, I certainly don't need to repeat. Um, the next slide, and this is something that I, I think the tenant advocates will cover in a little bit more detail, but the key here, so the yellow on this chart is showing the number of evictions. The left half is showing um, the pre-pandemic, and we have data from the Maryland courts starting in July of 2019, going right up and through the, the beginning of the pandemic. And what you can see is that the federal and state emergency orders had a, a relatively immediate impact in terms of both filing. So the green line is filing. The blue line is, um, is warrants of restitution, which is the second filing that needs to happen before an, a court-ordered eviction can actually be completed. And then the yellow um, is actual evictions reported by the court. So there was a temporary, uh, a, a temporary um, 
pause, but the, you can see that the filings are starting to go back up and evictions did not, in fact, completely come to a halt uh, during the pandemic. And, um, and again, this data, it ends as of July 2021, which is the last available court data that predated the end of both the federal CDC uh, eviction moratorium and the state emergency order. And so I think what we can expect is that these numbers are going to start to climb back up. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. And um, these are two, the next two slides are just a very quick sort of additional evidence from our office that uh, the we've seen an uptick in consumer complaints about evictions during the pandemic. Um, I think the graph shows that pretty convincingly. Um, the last bar is year to date. So that's we still have several more months to go. Um, but, you know, so we knew that evictions were a problem and we know that they continue to be a problem. And the next uh, slide reflects that as well. This is, so the last slide was written complaints. And this slide is um, the intake hotline that our consumer protection division has. And I'll just note that even though the, the total number of complaints looks as though it's going down, our hotline because of the pandemic has been running two hours less per day. And so we think that that combined with the moratoria that were in place uh, likely explains why complaints actually appear to have been going down, at least phone complaints, um, during this period of time. Um, we can go to the next slide, and I'm not going to read this, but this is essentially just um, some examples of the kinds of complaints that we're getting in terms of the illegal evictions that have been happening even during the pandemic, um, you know, sending notices uh, that they that people would be ev evicted when there were protections in place, um, changing the locks, self help evictions, um, and uh, the like. So uh, we can go to the next and the last slide, which is. Um, really where the meat of this comes in about um, the what can be done now that we don't have the federal and state eviction protections in place. Um, and I'll focus, I'll try to go quickly and then um, turn it over. Uh, I'll just note a few things. Um, so, you know, there was great, as this committee knows, there were some uh, great uh, things that came out of last uh, session, uh, including a notice requirement requiring that landlords send notice um, to the tenants in advance um, before they file for an eviction in district court. And, um, and HB 18, now Chapter 746, and I want to thank Delegate Wilkins uh, for her leadership on this, which um, obviously created a statewide access to counsel program. Um, and part of what I'll talk about is uh, what I think everybody here knows also, which is that that is currently unfunded. And so um, it's, it's great. It was the, the General Assembly was the second uh, legislature in the country to pass a statewide right to counsel uh, provision. Um, the task for the, the bill creates a task force in our office uh, and the attorney general has announced the makeup of that task force. They will start to get to work on October 1st. There was already some planning that's uh, going on and uh, I will be staffing that task force. And without funding, obviously there's limited um, work. The task force has plenty to do, but there's not much that the statewide access to counsel program can do without funding. And so I'll start there just briefly, um, you know. Yeah, we do, on, we do need you to try to go briefly because we do have three more presenters. Yeah, okay. So I will just say um, ERAP, both ERAP2 and fiscal recovery funds um, are, ERAP1 is sort of gone, but ERAP2 and the fiscal recovery funds are available for 10% of the ERAP2 funds are available for, uh, for legal services and other housing stability services. We've asked 
uh, Governor Hogan to, at the state level, allocate those funds to fund HB 18's uh, special fund. Um, but what we really need eventually is a stable line item funding for that program. Um, other jurisdictions, there are local jurisdictions, jurisdictions, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, and Baltimore City, who are using their own funds, local funds, and state funds um, to fund legal counsel programs. That's one of the key aspects of eviction prevention. Um, and I can talk more about that, but I'm going to just keep going. Um, the, the federal government really is a partner in this. They have had um, ongoing uh, webinars and guidance and are really trying to use their convening role to share best practices. And so most of what I'm about to say, and I'll say it just as very quickly as I can, um, is a coordinated effort. And so speaking to Dele Delegate Krim's question about outreach, the places that are having the most success uh, getting eviction uh, or rental assistance funds out the door are there's partnerships between courts and rental assistance administrators and community organizations so that there's targeted outreach door knocking to make people make sure that people uh, show up to court that they know that there are resources available having rental assistance administrators inside the courthouse who make announcements in the courtroom about the availability of funding um, legal representation referral programs. Anne Arundel County and Baltimore County have um, really good examples of, of what they're doing to build these uh, programs out. And I am going to stop there just because we're short on time. Thank you, Ms. Tulin. I'm just going to take a real quick point of privilege here and ask you on this particular slide, which is the meat, I think, of your presentation, if you would send back to the committee specific bullets under each of these with respect to improve the distribution and what that means, the status of the legal representation since it's not funded and what's happening, uh, a description of what disincentivizing ser ser serial filings would be um, so that we have something that the co-chair and I can be working with between now and the next meeting and get to the rest of the members as we do our recommendations. So if you could take this slide and break it out for us in more detail, that would be helpful. Senator, you Absolutely. want to move now then to Kat Alexander at Princeton. I've looked at her testimony and I'm thinking in terms of time, um, we can read and it's probably best if you start to explain to us sections three and four, which are the context for Maryland's filing rate and the what can be done in Maryland and let us kind of read sections one and two, um, if I may make a suggestion. That was exactly what I was thinking. It's It's been great to hear um, so much of what I wanted to say already covered by other speakers. Um, you might have noticed I always start when I'm speaking with um, policymakers, you know, assuming coming in with uh, not as much uh, background information um, and work my way up. But fortunately, we've got a very informed crowd here, so I can kind of skip ahead. So um, the sort of major things that I want to make sure we all take away here are first that um, eviction filings on their own matter uh, and that it's not just about um, the, the formal, you know, writs getting sent out and the numbers of uh, people put out by the sheriff. Um, that eviction filing number is important and the eviction filings carry harm on their own. Uh, second, that we want to work against having a culture of routine eviction filing amongst landlords. Um, we have this perception that um, an eviction filing is a last resort among landlords. This is something that landlords um, uh, put out that they, you know, um, they speak about eviction as, as a last resort, um, but we have research now that shows that this is not actually the case, that landlords are often using uh, eviction filings as a routine rent collection uh, tool. Um, and then the third thing I want for us all to take away is that there are uh, policy solutions and ideas out there. Uh, and so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We, we can take, uh, 
programs and policies that are in place in other places and build off of those, um, which is really reassuring because I feel like often we come in thinking, you know, this is a big problem and nobody's ever fixed it. Um, but that's, you know, not actually the case. So I'm going to try to be as brief as possible to leave more time for questions, but, um, to jump right in to, um, speaking about why filings matter. Um, so in Maryland prior, you know, currently, um, when a landlord wants to file a non-payment of rent eviction case, whereas in most states, you know, you have that notice to quit in advance of the filing in Maryland, historically, that filing has been the first step. Um, I know in the new law beginning, I believe October 1st, um, there will be a 10 day notice period implemented. Um, that's great because we want to reduce the number of filings uh, coming through these filings not only create you know, the stress for the family, they are setting this process into, into motion, um, but they also show up on renters' uh, tenant screening profiles. So they block access to high quality housing uh, for years following that filing coming through. Even if that case is dismissed later on, if that filing shows up on your screening, you can still be denied housing, um, which is a major, issue. And so uh, as the presenter one before me mentioned, you know, there's this large number of eviction filings and the small number of evictions listed. Uh, that's because a lot of people will move out in advance of uh, the filing judgment already coming through. Uh, people will start moving out at all stages of the eviction process. Um, which is why it's important that we are reducing the number of eviction filings. We want to reduce the number of people who are entering into this court process. One step for that that's already been taken is creating this notice uh, period prior to filing. Other steps would look like um, implementing mandatory mediation prior to filing to evict a tenant. Uh, when we're looking at eviction filings for, you know, a few hundred dollars in rent, um, it's not necessarily a given that we should go straight to the courthouse and, and file a suit rather than, for instance, applying for rental assistance, uh, starting that application on the tenant's behalf so that, um, you know, we're looking to address the problem uh, through another way. Um, so that's that's on filings. Now on serial eviction filings in this culture of routine filings. So um, when the eviction lab was first starting up and collecting millions of eviction records from across the country, we noticed that there were some areas, Maryland being one of them, where we would see the same landlord tenant pair show up in the court records at the same address month after month. And at first this was like, okay, well, is there some kind of duplication problem? Like if your landlord is filing to evict you in May, June, and July, you can only be evicted once. Um, but we found that this was actually, these were all genuine. The landlord was filing this eviction every single month. Um, and that's why in Maryland, in our data, we have more eviction filings than renting households, um, which is shocking and is only true of Maryland. It's not true of any other state in our data. Um, and so what was happening was that landlords were using the court system as a rent collection mechanism, where as soon as the tenant is short on rent, because they're, you know, they paid a few days late, maybe they actually need to pay in two installments because they get paid twice a month. The landlord is filing an eviction suit and is starting this court process um, every single month. Um, and so when this is creating a lot of the, the case volume, and this is not true in other states, like not all states have the same kind of system. In other states, you'll have the number of case filings and the number of evictions are quite close together. Um, and these pairs don't show up multiple times because a landlord is only filing as a last resort. Um, and so when we're thinking about serial eviction cases in particular, um, we can think about 
facing, uh, figuring out the eviction crisis, not just as, all right, well, how can we fix uh, affordability for tenants? How can we, um, you know, deal with the tenant side, although that's very important, but we can think about it as, okay, how are we going to regulate this landlord behavior so that instead of landlords turning to eviction first, landlords are turning somewhere else? Uh, and so this is, I think, what Ms. Julian was, was speaking of about uh, disincentivizing serial eviction filings. Um, we want to make sure that landlords are thinking of an eviction filing as a traumatic last resort, because that's what it is for a tenant rather than thinking of an eviction filing as, oh, well, didn't get rent from that apartment or this apartment is 50 bucks short, so I'll go ahead and file an eviction filing because that's what I do. So to turn to um, what's happening sort of in other states, you know, the eviction lab is a, a national focused uh, research group. I'm actually a, a Baltimore resident. Um, oh. I'm, yeah, I, I'm a resident in Baltimore. I'm a student at night at the law school. Uh, and so, you know, when, when I speak to, to folks in Maryland, I'm like, these are my neighbors that I'm talking about. Um, so, so in other parts of the country, though, um, what, what are we seeing? So for the short, immediate term, in other parts of the country, we are seeing eviction moratoria still, or seeing off ramps for eviction moratoria that are um, preventing landlords from filing evictions and pushing tenants out before rental assistance can be distributed. Um, like we've at the eviction lab have said this whole time, um, eviction moratoria and financial assistance are two sides of the same coin. If you have just an eviction moratorium, that's just kind of kicking the can down the road. That's not paying the shortfall. If you have just emergency rental assistance, you have a risk that the tenant will be evicted before that benefit can reach them. So we really need to have both at the same time. And this may seem very late in the process to be instituting an eviction moratorium, but you know, Boston started a new eviction moratorium on August 31st as soon as the CDC eviction moratorium had been overturned. So you know, there is a precedent for other jurisdictions instituting eviction moratoria with the point being, um, you know, we need to buy some more time because it's taking a minute for this uh, aid to get out there. So uh, Alexander, could you um, just sort of summarize the next two what you can do and then we'll go into questions because I know people are, and I think that that will allow uh, us to kind of, for you to tell some of the points, that, sort of the more narrative that you're, that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So, so the next kind of points are um, other places, uh, something that can be adopted is uh, creating an eviction diversion program that pairs, that, that finds a way to move um, uh, these small rental disputes outside of the court system, um, for instance, into mediation, into settlement conferences. These are most effective when they happen prior to the court process, when you have to go through the eviction diversion program prior to filing, and that'll limit the number of people that are getting channeled into the eviction process, bearing in mind that any eviction filing comes with a risk of homelessness for that family. Um, and then the other two sort of points that I have in this section four are, um, you know, the create more housing supply and support families bottom line, which I'll kind of leave for uh, another time, and then modifying landlord tenant code to add more protections for renters. You know, one great step we're already through by creating this notice period. Um, there are other steps that would be possible, like um, masking eviction filings at the time of filing, so that um, these records are less likely to follow tenants and prevent their access to uh, housing in the future. This is something that California does, um, so it's something that could be done here as well. Um, I've got a bunch more examples and research and, and everything, but I'll, I'll leave it for questions now to see what the most pressing items are. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, 
I was talking while muted. Thank you both <laughs> on this broad topic. We certainly can spend more time, but I wanted to absolutely give Delegate Wilkins or anyone that wants to sort of jump in and talk, uh, ask some questions or comments. No questions for me. No comments, okay. Uh, uh, the, we're going to regroup back with Elliot Wilkins after this presentation. <laughs> sounds good. Um, I think one thing I wanted to, to ask um, with regard to the long-term effects of evictions, mm -hmm. could you both, and I, I think the AGs and um, you could talk about that um, because that's a really important, in addition to what we can do, but just talk a little bit about long-term effects. wants to go first. Uh, Ms. Phelan, do you want to go first? I was muted asking if you wanted to go first. Why don't you, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> yeah, so some uh, long-term effects that um, we've already seen in our research, so renters who experience eviction are uh, 11 to 22 percent more likely to lose their job in the next year. Um, Mothers who experience eviction in one study reported uh, depressive symptoms two years following that eviction in a different study, young adults who were surveyed um, who had experienced eviction uh, reported that they had poor health up to seven or eight years uh, after their eviction. Um, we know now that eviction not often results not just in one move, you know, I'm evicted from apartment A and I moved to evicted to apartment B, but in fact sets off a series of moves, like it takes a long time for people to get their feet back under them. So instead of, you know, going from A to B, it would look more like evicted from apartment A, uh, couch surf with a friend for apartment B, uh, a shelter for a little bit uh, in living situation C, finally get a new apartment, but it's in a not very great area. Uh, and so I move again after six months. And, you know, that kind of long-term instability has um, very detrimental effects for health, for stress, for your ability to hold down a job, for your kid's ability to uh, have consistent schooling. Um, like I mentioned, an eviction filing can follow renters for years blocking their access to high quality housing. So even if they can you know, afford now um, great housing in a spot with great schools, they may not be able to access that housing. Um, so, you know, we, we've got this growing uh, amount of evidence that is showing that, you know, as soon as that person is evicted, they are going to have, be experiencing ill effects because of that eviction for years in the future. And this also, um, has implications for, you know, the community as a whole and uh, cost to the state and local government where, you know, if you're looking at someone who is about to be evicted over about $2,000, which is roughly what we're looking at for claim amounts during the pandemic, um, sort of the state can pay for that in two ways. Either they can pay that $2,000 shortfall through emergency rental assistance or they can pay however much it's going to cost when they are providing homelessness services, when they are providing additional health care to that uh, individual. Um, and really, when, when you think about it in that analysis, paying that $2,000 to maintain that housing stability is a much lower cost versus paying for these long-term effects. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Ellis. Thank you, Senator Washington. Um, I have a couple questions for both ladies. Uh, uh, quick question, at least the first one. Uh, Ms. Tulin, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that the filing fee in Maryland is, I believe, $15, and nationally, it's 112 So in Maryland, who sets that filing fee? Is it legislative or what? So it's, uh, it, there are, there's a floor that's set currently by statute um, and the attorney general and others, um, other members of the general assembly introduced legislation last session to raise the filing fee to make it more uh, consistent with the national average. And uh, 
others on this uh, committee know as well as I do, if not better, the that it, it didn't pass in the end. Um, and so uh, that's certainly, uh, there There was legislation and, and perhaps will be legislation again in the coming session to raise the filing fee. The other thing I'll just say about that is that it also goes to, it, it, it. what it ultimately does is it can be a source of raising revenue. So it both disincentivizes serial filing. It also raises revenue that in at least one of the bills would have gone to fund uh, Maryland Legal Services Corporation, which then provides legal aid to low income tenants across the state. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer. Thank you so much. And um, Ms. Alexander, a uh, couple questions. Uh, these eviction filings, which are very high, and you, mm -hmm. you alluded to impact and follow renters throughout, is that like their credit score, since it's a public record, court filing, or does it go and really damage a folks' uh, credit uh, score? Uh, so the credit score issue is, is sort of less common, like the debt can go onto your credit score if um, your landlord files for a money judgment, which I, I'm not sure if it's the case in Maryland, whether that's a separate action than the possessory action. Um, but the real uh, thing that people are, are concerned about is there are private tenant uh, screening companies. And so uh, this is where, you know, if I apply for uh, an apartment, um, the landlord will go to one of uh, dozens of uh, tenant screening companies and run my name through and see like if it pops up. And those tenant screening companies have collected eviction records from courts uh, to, co to compile a database of, you know, who has been evicted. Um, these records have a tendency to have a lot of errors in them. Um, they're not super well regulated. Um, and so sort of the way that um, some states like California and Nevada have tried to uh, go about limiting the impact of these eviction filings is just by having that record as soon as it is filed, it is masked. So you that information only becomes available to, for instance, these tenant screening companies, that information only becomes available and part of the public record if the um, case eventually is found for the landlord. Um, okay, thank you. I would mm -hmm. love to follow up with you with that to really see who are these uh, companies in Maryland that are doing, mm -hmm. the gathering this database and maybe as a body, uh, we can look at that, uh, some kind of uh, regulation in Annapolis. So as a lowly senator, I'm just suggesting that. Uh, another quick question, uh, really quick. The eviction process in Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you have this uh, knowledge, Ms. Alexander, is how long is it? I mean, so if someone will is on the way to real eviction, so from the first mm -hmm. filing through when that person, stuff is removed with the uh, sheriff's uh, deputies, how long is that process? I think, Ms. Tulin, you'll be more familiar with the exact timeline in this state. Uh, yeah, so so as I referenced, there are two filings that are required. There's first a complaint, and now with the legislation that goes into effect on October 1st, there will be a 10-day notice requirement that's needed to, to um, be given to the tenant before that complaint can even be filed. Um, but once that complaint is filed, then there, the landlord needs to get a judgment. So it's tied to when there's a court hearing. And then once there's a hearing, once it's set for a hearing, and that's partly what landlords are saying in terms of the backlog is that the, because of the moratorium, there were lots of filings that happened during the moratorium, but the court uh, wasn't scheduling hearings as quickly, and also their their um, uh, their personnel were limited because of the in person restrictions and all of that. And so, once there's a hearing, and the landlord gets a judgment, there's a four day um, period where the the tenant can appeal. And if they don't appeal, then the landlord can file the second filing, which is called a petition for a warrant of restitution, and that then gets fined by the court and then um, the eviction gets 
schedule. This essentially gives the sheriff or whoever in the county is responsible for um, for conducting the eviction. Um, they uh, they get that, and then they can then it gets scheduled. So it can take some amount of time, and it's tied to both the court process and then the sheriff's scheduling. Um, but again, I think I would just stress here that many people who end up losing their homes don't go through that entire process because they don't show up at the hearing. They see that they, they get a notice or they get a complaint and they don't know what help is available and they don't want it on their, on to impact future housing. And so they just leave. Okay, um, so thank you for that. So pre COVID say COVID is a kind of a one-off, hopefully pre COVID that process will take what a year, um, just, just a wild guess. Not less than a year. I would say, you know, I don't have great data on this and the advocates who haven't had a chance to even um, participate yet may be able to speak to this better, but it's, it's months. It's definitely not a year. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just really concerned because, um, you know, with so many filings affecting whether it's credit score directly or individuals ability to get housing because they have this private database that landlords use. And if, you know, landlords are using this process to really start along, uh, even, I know compared to other states where it might be say a month for someone to get evicted. If, our, if we as a government body make it so hard and stretched out to really do these evictions, the landlords, might be rushed into court really quick to really do these filings. It might be a government issue where we are forcing them into court really quick to get the process started really early. And so we, I think we need to look at that to say, hey, wait a minute, are we part of the problem? And I'd love to hear uh, from the landlord groups, why are they in court so much? Uh, to hear with their perspective, if we as a government body are causing this uh, process to be stretched out. So it's on um, some questions in my brain to really look at the other side to see why this is happening and it's so really um, impacting folks' ability to find housing or and or their credit scores. Really huge. Thank result. you. And I just want to say this is a really important topic, so we don't want to rush it. I would just say, colleagues, we'd like to extend our meeting at least till 315. If you have to go, you have to go, but it's on the record. It's an important thing, um, but we will extend. We'll continue. We'll have this discussion. I, I didn't see if it was Delegate Wilkins or Krim who was first, so um, whichever one of you was first. Thank you. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, so... I'm going to continue on my theme about more of a reach out effort because it's obvious to me from uh, reports that I'm hearing on, on the news that uh, people, people who need this money are not getting it or don't know about how to get it. So uh, we talked a, a little bit about that Census data, I think you, uh, Leah, had that. So where did those charts come from? How do you know that data? How do you know that? Uh, so the, the Census Bureau at the beginning of COVID started doing, um, it's the time periods have changed over the course. They have several phases, but they're sending uh, surveys to their electronic surveys, and they asked a variety of questions about education and all sorts of things. And it's all available on the Census Bureau website. And so those charts I put together by pulling the Excel spreadsheets and, and putting them together. There's also the National Equity Atlas that uh, is compiling that data. And so if you go to their um, rent debt or I, I, I can get the exact link and provide it in my supplement to the committee. But um, so that's where that data is coming from. It's not perfect because it's extrapolated, um, but it is, you know, that's the best that we've had in terms of who's behind. Um, and if I can just, I mean, I very much agree with you, Delegate Krim, that outreach is absolutely key to this. This will also be in my supplement. The jurisdictions that are having the best success with 
distribution of uh, rental assistance funds and eviction prevention have culturally relevant, targeted outreach programs in partnership with community-based organizations that know the communities that have trust relationships, door knocking, text messages, phone calls. Um, it's really a boots on the ground effort that um, that needs to happen in order to be successful. So, so let me ask you this. So that census data, are they getting that information from individual people or is that some government bureaucrat just making all that up? Just asking. So it's actual people who are completing the surveys. And okay. then the numbers are extrapolated, you know, based on okay. statistical modeling. So, so we could then be sending information to those people who are filling out this paperwork for the census, correct? Yes, we, we could be doing that. We can't. No, we can't. I well, I suspect that the, it's anonymized. And so okay. we don't have, we don't know who those people are. Um, okay. But, so, all right. but well, I do let's... think that, sorry, I was just going to say, I mean, I think your point about SNAP, people who are getting other benefits, I mean, there are, and again, I'll update this, um, I think Pittsburgh is an example where, you know, their cross-coordinated efforts to reach those people and those populations who, you know, maybe didn't fill out the survey, but are the, the households that are most likely to be in need of rental assistance and other eviction prevention strategies. Okay, and I have another question on the filing fee for the landlords. So um, you said that there was a bill in the legislature that wanted to increase that. So you know that bill better than I, obviously. So, um, so could we like do like the, the first filing is the same filing fee, but then increase that filing fee as there are more? So, so I know the house passed the bill. Let me just get in here because we're getting into details that we could talk about later with time, but uh, the, the bill died in, in the Senate. And so I think we have to address it in the Senate. Um, and I think we have to address, you know, what interests caused that to happen. Um, but so um, I will, you know, uh, keep uh, Ms. Tulin from talking about that and we'll, we'll just address it as, as a yeah. vote. Uh, so Delegate Wilkins. Senator, Senator Ellis got that message, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, Delegate Wilkins. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. And thank you so much to both of our speakers for all of their leadership and advocacy. Very much appreciate all that you've done to help support our Maryland families. My question is for Eviction Lab. In the interest of time, you can feel free to send this as a follow-up material. Uh, something that on the topic of data, actually, that I found really challenging is as a state having real-time eviction data and also dynamic data that we can you know, really be able to track trends and see how we're doing. I just, took, I just took a look and I think we're doing a little bit better because we have data as of July, but still given that very recently we've had so many changes with the, with the CDC protections being lifted, the state protections being lifted, it would be really important right now to have a sense of um, what is happening, be able to track on that. Um, we know Eviction Lab is very much known for, um, you know, the data that you all collect and analyze. So. Um, if you're able to share and follow up with some recommendations for us around how Maryland is doing with our data tracking, how we can better track the situation around evictions, that would be something that would be extremely useful given you all's expertise on that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll send you a follow-up email. Great. Thank you. Thank you both so much. We'll continue and revisit this topic again, even if we in future meetings bring back some component on it. So um, uh, our, our advocacy, uh, HR, uh, HPR and public justice, uh, Homeless Persons Representation Project and the Public Justice Center, please, uh, Carissa and Zafar. Uh, I hope that you've, you know, don't mean to give you short shrift, but if you could reduce this to as quickly as possible uh, and then get to sort of your main points that you want us to address uh, and we will hopefully that you see that a lot of what you're talking about is uh, has already been discussed so no need to repeat. Thank you Senator Washington. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay great thank you. Uh, my name is Carissa Hatfield. I'm a staff attorney with the Homeless Persons Representation Project. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today um, at the Joint Committee. 
you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, as was referenced by Delegate Wilkins, um, there were two executive orders um, in the court that acted as what we would call affirmative defenses in the state of Maryland um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, preventing um, immediate eviction for some tenants who qualified. Um, however, um, Governor Hogan's order, which is the first of the two that we, we had here in the state of Maryland, expired as of August 15th. Um, any tenants who were covered under Governor Hogan's executive order, um, whose judgments were held at the time of their cases, um, are now going to be um, entered. Um, any warrants of restitution that are sought by landlords um, will be set for a hearing within 21 days. Um, and tenants would have at that time the opportunity to defend that case, either to know that they've made payment or that they vacated the premises. Um, otherwise, those cases will move forward um, and they will move to, into status preparing for eviction. Uh, next slide, please. Likewise, the CDC order, which has had a number of ups and downs um, over the last uh, year and a half, I would say, um, is the best way to characterize it, uh, was as recently as August 26, struck down by the Supreme Court, which means that it's also no longer in effect. Um, any tenants who had um, their judgments held under the CDC order, which was a number of our tenants, we found that was a little easier to use as advocates uh, than the governor's order. Um, those are also entered now as judgments and where landlords seek warrants, um, hearings will be held and tenants will have to prove whether they have made payment um, or whether they have vacated the premises in order to avoid an eviction being scheduled. Um, next slide. I think really the thing to take away from this is that uh, failure to pay rent filings are increasing um, as we um, initially began to come out of this pandemic. And of course, now we're heading into Delta. Um, these filings still continue to rise. Um, and even as courts are setting hearings for warrants of restitution related to the CDC order um, and the governor's order, tenants are currently being evicted. Um, I think it was important and I heard my colleague at the eviction lab um, emphasized that eviction never really truly stopped um, in the state of Maryland uh, and that tenants continue to be evicted today um, and will be evicted in the coming days. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is just a chart to demonstrate that filings are increasing. Um, we saw a brief dip in the winter as the courts pulled back um, from failure to pay rent filings um, and court cases uh, due to the rise in COVID cases. Um, but since that time, since that has been suspended, um, the court cases and court filings continue to rise and continue to be heard. Next slide, please. Um, my colleagues at DHCD have already discussed the rental assistance programs in great detail. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, just to say that um, there has been um, near, not nearly enough of these funds distributed to tenants um, and we are seeing significant delays, at least at the city level. Um, I've had tenants who I, they started their process in February um, and still have not heard anything about their rental applications. So we are seeing that at the local level. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I did just kind of want to, cause I have, this is something I really wanna emphasize is that as we talk about numbers, as we talk about statistics, um, as we talk about data, um, there are real people who are experiencing eviction and who are on the cusp of eviction, um, even as we have this hearing. Um, these are just two tenants that I represented. I am still representing um, Talia and Greg, um, who had their landlord has refused to cooperate with eviction prevention um, throughout this time period, um, has filed multiple failure to pay rent cases, and has gotten warrants of restitution for cases where they didn't appear. They had two evictions scheduled for the beginning of August. The only way that they avoided those evictions um, was going to their local church and going to their friends and asking for money to avoid being evicted because rental assistance had not reached them. Um, and my client, Madison, um, applied for rental assistance, told eviction prevention that she had a pending eviction coming, um, and she received no response and was evicted before rental assistance ever came to her. Um, she was forced to move out of Baltimore City um, and has now been advised by eviction prevention that she no longer qualifies for Baltimore City rental assistance because she was forced to move out of the county. Um, I did want to add, even as of this morning, talking about serial filings for low amounts of money, um, in one of the more extreme cases that we've seen, 
Uh, my colleague handled a case this morning in rent court um, where a landlord had filed seven cases uh, for $2 a piece and was attempting to evict the tenant based on $2. Um, and that landlord um, insisted on even if they couldn't get the $2, um, that they try to get the legal fees for filing failure to pay rent against the tenant um, in court. So we're seeing this every day. We're seeing folks who are on the cusp of eviction. We're seeing folks who are having serial filings. My colleagues and myself have multiple tenants who have multiple cases open with us where we're representing them. And this is the reality that we're seeing. And these tenants have applied for eviction pre prevention and are waiting on applications and have received no answers. Um, so I think we're, we're in a very dire place right now for a lot of tenants. Um, and it's, it seems dramatic, but unfortunately it is dramatic and we're in a very dramatic place right now for those folks. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna leave it to my colleague Zephyr to kind of chat about some of our recommendations, a lot of which have already been covered, um, but I'll give him the opportunity to just kind of state our perspective on those. And then we're happy to answer questions after he's done. Oh, you're muted. We're not able to hear you. You're muted. There you go. I'm sorry. I did a whole introduction. You did. Time. Yeah. So going back, I'm Zephyr Shaw. I'm a housing attorney at the Public Justice Center. You may also have met me or seen me on Zoom over the last session, uh, doing advocacy for Renters United Maryland, of, uh, of which Public Justice Center and Homeless Persons Representation Project are a part of, along with over 30 other organizations across the state. Um, so and just to you know, go from where Crystal left off, um, just as a matter of what the ERAP programs are doing, one of the critical pieces um, to emphasize is the need to use the funds that are available for relocation assistance. Because uh, we are increasingly seeing that at this point in the uh, pandemic and uh, the economic uh, quagmire that folks are in, um, the, the 12 months back rent may not even be attractive to their landlord uh, who wants to cut all losses here. Uh, or the tenant doesn't really want to stay in a property that has been uh, likely deliberately made so uninhabitable uh, that the tenant is forced to leave. And so relocation assistance is really becoming more and more necessary. The Treasury Department allows it, but we're not seeing um, that utilization of the funds at the local level to the extent that I think our clients uh, are telling us they need. Uh, so moving to the, some other policy recommendations within your realm, which is legislation, I want to talk about eviction diversion, uh, how to deal with eviction records, and also eviction data. So these have all come up, so I won't go into all the substantive uh, parts of this, but I want to also say it's great that these are all issues that have come up in prior legislation. So let's start with eviction diversion. Uh, House Bill 1312, which was uh, Delegate Wilkins's emergency uh, COVID-19 eviction and housing relief bill uh, from last session, uh, dealt with or uh, provided a blueprint for eviction diversion, as did uh, Delegate Melissa Wells's bill HB 52, which was co-sponsored, I was like cross-filed by uh, Senator Sidnor in um, the Senate. And both of these bills provide uh, all the, the parts and the glue that we sorely lack right now. And so uh, what I mean by that is um, we don't have the requisite legal mechanism to tie what's happening in the district courts across the state with eviction procedures to what is happening with the rollout of distribution of funds with the local ERAPs. Um, and you absolutely need that. That's what the White House has been talking about uh, for several weeks. Um, this was referenced by Ms. Uh, Tulin, Ms. Alexander, um, if you go, I suggest you do this in, in your discussion. If you go to um, NS, sorry, I, yeah, I want to get this right, ncsc.org. This is the website for the National um, Center for State Courts. They have an eviction diversion toolkit that will assess where your state is on eviction diversion. And it really summarizes what you can do at a low level of diversion, a medium level of diversion, and a high level of diversion. And based on that description, you'll see 
that we are at a no level of diversion. And, I mean, I smile, but you know, it's it's deeply frustrating that we had uh, we had predicted to be in this this mess, and unfortunately, these the eviction diversion process and these bills was not taken up, um, you know, to pass in the legislation. Uh, we absolutely need what many jurisdictions have, which is a mandatory requirement to uh, you, for landlords to use rental assistance in order to be eligible to file their eviction case. Virginia did that. Pencil, uh, Philadelphia has done that. State of Washington. You know, all the all the great case studies have that essential component. And just to be clear, that on this on this toolkit, that only gets you to low level. House Bill 52 from last session provided the high level, which is to add a required status hearing mechanism in this rapid fare to pay rent process. You know, right now, because of COVID-19 protocols, the court has provided time. You know, if you file a case in one of the high uh, uh, eviction rate jurisdictions right now, a landlord's unlikely to get to a trial date for several months. That's wild. That's never happened before. And unfortunately, we don't have the mechanism in place to uh, usher those litigants into a pre-trial diversion process, uh, even while they have the time. So we're, we're really missing the policymaking uh, part of this. I think I, we got to give credit to all the local ERAPs. They've done administratively what they can do. I don't, I don't criticize them for much, given that we didn't achieve what we needed to at a state policymaking level in 2021. Um, now, with, uh, I'll go to the next slide. Eviction records was something that the House did pass last session in a bill, HB 1008 died in JPR. Um, this bill did begin the process of providing for sealing of eviction records immediately after a case is dismissed without uh, any uh, awarded relief to the landlord or within three years after uh, a judgment was awarded to the landlord. This is a starting point for failure to pay rent cases and addresses uh, a lot of what Ms. Alexander uh, talked to you about. Um, Delegate Lehman had a bill uh, on tenant screening. That bill number, if I'm seeing this was 1223. This, uh, among other things, included the requirement that landlords not be able to use um, information from sealed records in their uh, assessment of a tenant. Uh, a lot of times these assessments are, are given by a consumer reporting company agency, uh, but this bill would, would restrict how landlords use that information. So it doesn't restrict the consumer companies. It restricts landlords from using that, informa that information in the denial of a lease. Uh, and then finally, next slide. We get to eviction data on the next slide. Uh, this bill also has come to uh, the legislature uh, two, two years in a row, 2020 and 2021, um, essentially asking for bare minimum uh, requisite collection and reporting of data about evictions from the courts and the sheriff throughout the state. Um, this would answer the questions of, for instance, how many are there, where are they based on zip code or census tract? Uh, what type of evictions are they? You know, are they for fair to pay rent, breach of lease, are they foreclosures, et cetera? Uh, but not really tell you a lot about the people being evicted. And in our conversations with uh, academics, with local departments of housing, they actually really would like that information. And so we, uh, we need to achieve what's been in those prior bills, uh, HB 1312 most recently for collection and reporting of data. But there, is an, there should be an opportunity, there is a need, I think recognized during this pandemic that we need to know more about, uh, for instance, the demographics of the defendants in these cases, how much rent was at issue in these cases. Uh, so, some information which has nothing to do with an eviction case but precedes an eviction case like uh, lease non-renewals. Um, now, my final point is that uh, for these three components I just talked about, there needs to be funding. We know from previous legislative battles the past two to three years that the Maryland Judiciary, Chief Judge of the District Court, uh, Judge Morrissey, has opposed, ha has provided, uh, you know, adamant uh, uh, disapproval or just some for each of these policy considerations, mainly because they require funding. And so eviction diversion 
uh, we recommend uh, should be a budget item alongside, importantly, access to council funding. Uh, the dollar amount for that that we proposed last year when the bill was on the table, HB 18, was $28.5 million. Uh, of course, some of that might come from uh, a, sur a surcharge on eviction filings, but we have to consider that that may not happen and, and what, what baseline funding will it be. It makes sense, and you're seeing this in, in some of those best cases um, that, that were referenced about eviction diversion, that eviction diversion is married to access to counsel, right to counsel, is effective. Um, it takes money to, to create the data, to maintain the data, um, and, and provide that dynamic uh, data online that Delegate Wilkins referenced earlier. And of course, too, even sealing of records. Right. Um, electronic Thank you so records much. Records. We understand. Thank okay. you. It costs money. <laughs> all it right. costs Thank money, you. yeah. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you for your you time. Thank you very much. I and again, it. if we have an opportunity, we will, we will be revisiting this. Uh, okay, uh, I'm handing it back to you, uh, Delegate, for the closeout. Thank you all so, so very much. Um, thank you. As usual, um, we've got a significant amount of information and um, this begs more questions than usually we get answers. Um, members of the committee, we're going to get some significant follow-up from the presenters today, specifically with um, the Attorney General's Office and specific recommendations and we're going to work with um, the Eviction Lab University to get some examples of what other states are doing. I think that in closing, this last part has left the question on whether or not the courts and or the governor can do something on their own now um, and not have to wait for statutory um, direction that wouldn't then take effect until June or October. Um, so I think that Chair and I now will look to work with the AG's office and to see what we can recommend to leadership that they at least ask the governor and or the courts to do now to create some kind of ramp while people are waiting since only 25% of the funding has been um, administered. So with that staff, please tell us the date of the next meeting. Also um, in between, we have heard from property owners who want an opportunity to be able to come in at one of the future hearings to explain their perspective. And we will- We will do that. Yes. We can accommodate that. Staff, anybody? Uh, this is Tom, staff. Uh, so our next meeting is going to be on October the 5th at 1 p.m. Okay, we have another chock full and robust agenda then, and um, we will be doing a lot of work Welcome to the new members, buckle up, hang on. We've got a lot of work to do. And thank you, uh, Delegate Wilkins, we know that this is um, an area that you're an advocate in and have you with us um, as we work towards this uh, report for the speaker. Okay, anything and else? The Senate, and the Senate president, remember the speaker. Oh, Senate <laughs> president, yeah. I think, I think that the Senate president's letter might be in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. All right, everyone, take care. Thanks for staying longer. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.